Powered by Riverside FM. All right. Welcome to what is both experimental and also not experimental. This is the Quantum Photons. We are currently live on Twitter. We are actually currently live on Twitter at A Delayed Teacher. If you're watching us there, um, awesome. Thank you for tuning in. I need to mute myself because <laughs> um, I am hearing myself in, in the background. So my name's Aaron. And I'm Stefan. And this is the Quantum Photons. It's a science podcast. It is absolutely um, all about science, all about everything. <laughs> Well, welcome back to the Quantum Photons. My name is Aaron, and that's Stefan on the other screen. And today, it's the first day we've actually kind of scheduled. Oh, scheduled isn't the right word. The first day we've kind of outlined what we're going to talk about. And in our first episode, we talked a lot about who we were as scientists. I am not. Um, I am a language arts scientist. I'm a teacher. Um, and Stefan is on the road in, in school and has taken part in a lot of sciency NASA like NASA um, experiences. And so today we figured, you know what? We should start at the beginning ish and talk about rockets. So we've got an outline, but I will very transparently warn you there may be some jumping around. Uh, it may be a little bit of a tilt a whirl as we navigate through our structure and how things are supposed to go. <laughs> so we ask for your grace and your mercy upon us as we at times may stumble or we may stride confidently from the starting line to the finishing tape. But that's please... what we need to say is we're just going to stride confidently. <laughs> yeah. It's, we're going to fake it till we make it. No, we're going to uh, no, be, not we're fake be... it. <laughs> we're not faking anything tonight. No, 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 no. This is the real deal. This is the E! True Hollywood story of rocket science. Um, okay, don't hype it that much. <laughs> <laughs> it's, we're just, it's going to be out of control. It's going to be great. It's, it's fine. Everything's fine. It's going to be out of this world. Uh, oh, <laughs> ba -dum -bum uh, so let's start. We got, we've got to start somewhere. So it's important that we start with a brief... And again, this is not exhaustive. This is not encyclopedia. This is a brief history of rockets. And I'm going to rely on Stefan to kind of hold me accountable and keep me on the straight and narrow as we go through this. A little bit's going to be, some of it's going to be me, but some of it's also going to be Stefan kind of talking about his knowledge and stuff like that. So we're going into the history of thing. And the first thing that we have to really talk about, which has become more of a modern conversation, is the, the, the real true reality of what happened po pre-World pre War II and post-World War II. Um, before, World War, before, in, before World War II and up to a certain point in World War II, we were losing the rocket race. Um, the United States, ever, nobody was, was really doing well. Um, the, the guys who were doing the rockets really well were unfortunately the Germans because they had the rocket scientists. They had the Werner von Braun's. They had the people who knew and, and were making strides and designed the V2 and they're like ev everything was working with when it came to the rocket side of things for Germany. And what's interesting, and it's something that's just started to be talked, started to have been talked about now more recently is when Von Braun and his scientists, the, the Nazi scientists, because there's no doubt they were a part of that party, they were then either recruited or they defected or a little of both over to the United States. And it was at this point that the game changed because now we had the brains. 
we had the brain power to begin to design rockets, to begin to not just use rockets for weaponry, but to use rockets to get to space. And so Werner von Braun and Warner von Braun and his team directly changed history for the United States and NASA. And a lot of what we saw after that was an acceleration of the space program um, and everything there. So as a as again, a quick it's, aside, um, yeah. before rockets, as in rockets going to space, the whole point yeah. of recruiting Von Braun and his team was for what the military called Operation Paperclip, which was to develop okay. guided missiles for the United States. So that was the yeah. initial reasoning for Warner Von Braun and his team. It wasn't actually yeah. until a little later when they moved to the Redstone Arsenal in uh, Huntsville, near Huntsville, Alabama, that things started to change a little bit. Um, yeah. After they had made these ballistic missiles, um, na- uh, the president was like, well, mm, okay, we need to maybe switch gears. So um, he transferred his rocket development group there um, yeah. to what is now known as NASA. Uh, so that is how the yeah. whole NASA story began. NASA came from not only the president deciding, hey, we need to develop rockets, but a majority right. part of that team was actually making rockets to fight the bad guys. That's what started yeah. NASA. And it's kind of crazy to think that, but that's where it came from. So, yeah. There is a. So, again, I'm not a NASA scientist or a NASA employee or, or have really like anything with NASA, but there's been a lot of, I guess the word would be pressure and, and, and conversation around the idea of accountability with NASA's past. Um, Werner, Warner von Braun and, and his connection to the Nazi party is absolutely a conversation. I think that's worth having without invalidating the impact and effect that he and his scientists had on the future spaceflight. We wouldn't have gotten to the moon or anywhere where we were supposed to go without that situation happening. But it doesn't make it okay for what he did for the Nazis and for his membership and their membership in the Nazi party. I want to make that very clear because it's not a, there are, and we I, we either talked about it or I've talked with somebody else about this, but there's been kind of this washing of the historical backgrounds of a lot of people in NASA who have those those little kind of that dirty laundry where hey this guy did this bad thing or they did this thing and we're not going to really talk about it we're going to just write a glowing review or a biography about him and that's that's what's going to be officially in the books versus a critical eye going, Hey, you know, these guys, there, there's some history there. We need to, we need to be honest about where they came from. And so that's the context of this piece of this part of this kind of section of the episode is, is that we can't talk about any of it without acknowledging that. Yeah, we, we stole their scientists. We, we got them and that was the game changer. There's a reason why these guys were very, they were very smart. They were very intellectual. They knew and understood the science of it and they understood how to make it work. Um, and they just, they had an eye for it. They had a brain for it. And we just, we were not able to get there until these guys stepped in. So to be very clear, that's, I just wanted to put that at the beginning because I know there's going to be people who'd be like, well, why didn't you mention this thing? Well, we did. We made sure. Um, so Stefan gathered us a link from sciencelearn.org, which we, I'm the no, I'm the not knowing guy. I'm the guy who doesn't know anything and needs to learn things. And so why Stefan exists, well, he exists because he's, he's a good guy and he's interesting and he's fascinating. He's got lots of topics, but his part in this podcast is I want to go. I, I put the big question out there of like, I literally just did like line number two, the various rocket models. And <laughs> Stefan was like, well, what do you want to know? And I said, everything. And he was just like, okay, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to be here for a few hours. So ver- the, I guess the first, the various rocket models kind of take, there's a, you're, this is a historical thing. So this, this is pretty cool. Kind of walk us through 
I guess the history of it a little bit and how far we've come and how far we had to go to get there. Okay. So, uh, first off, uh, this is a very comprehensive list, so I'm probably going to skip parts of it. Um, the first thing you actually need to know, which most people do not know is rockets actually, uh, began in China. Uh, they called them Chinese fire arrows. That was the true, the very first rocket that ever existed was an arrow created by the Chinese. Uh, They used it against Mongol invaders. However, as time went, uh, so the German (laughs) Germans uh, were uh, the first to actually invent the two-stage rocket that reached higher altitudes. Um, As we kept going, uh, the first successful liquid propellant rocket was actually done in 1926 by Robert H. Goddard, or... Uh, uh, the person who, I mean, if you know NASA, Goddard Flight or Goddard Space Flight Center, that's who it's mm-hmm. named after. So he was the first person to fly a rocket powered by liquid oxygen. Uh, herein, it will be known as LOX because it's just easier to say it that way. And gasoline. Okay. Uh, gasoline is not anything that's really used anymore in rocket propulsion. But back in 1926, yeah. you didn't have all the intricacies you do now. So right. the first manned uh, rocket flight was actually Fritz Van Oppel, I think is how you say his name. Uh, he mm-hmm. flew, or yeah, he flew in a rocket-propelled plane in Germany. Next came the ah. V-2 rocket, which is really when rockets started to become what we know a rocket as. Um, it was very interesting because the V-2 rocket actually burnt oxygen and alcohol. That's how it did its thing. Huh. Um, which, to my knowledge... There's no rocket currently we use that burns alcohol. I could be wrong, but that's to my knowledge so far. Um, yeah, well, and what you, what's interesting is, is that it was at a rate of one ton every seven seconds. Mm-hmm. That is hecka fast. It very. Like, very. I, I think what's fascinating to us in 2024 is you think about, okay, well, you, then that, how, how many tons of... of of that, do you have to load on a rocket um, to make it go where it needs to go? And that the math on that just makes my brain go, nope, don't want to think about that because that's a lot of it's a lot of it's a lot of weight because then you got to yep. counter the weight with the strength of the rocket to get it to go where it needs to go. Um, obviously, in 1942, the Germans were very focused on using it for a war type use Correct. and for atta- using it against civilians. And, and and soldiers, which obviously we don't we're not particularly fond of. The V two rocket was was one of the greatest weapons and and most horrifying weapons of, of World War Two because of it was it was powerful and it did damage. It was um, also the first rocket ever capable to reach space. Okay. Well that that I did not know. Yep. Uh that's that's terrifying. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what happens after what happens after the V two rocket? So the V two rocket was pretty much like the uh, uh, precursor to intercontinental ballistic missiles (ICBMs) okay. or yep. continental ballistic missiles, whichever you prefer. Um, so the next big thing would be the first satellite was launched by Russia, Sputnik one. Uh, yep. Then America was like, we need to launch a satellite, so it went to the Explorer one. Now, these aren't rockets, but I'm just trying to give a brief history of how this all yep. began. So yep. after that, NASA was founded. Uh, Russia then landed a probe on the moon. Uh, we launched the first weather satellite. Yep. Uh, the Russians uh, were the first to actually orbit Earth with Yuri Gagarin. Uh, so let's can, can we talk about let's let's take a I'm gonna take a I'm gonna take a side route for a second. Are you do you are you familiar with the stories of Russia's various experiments, uh, uh, like failed experiments with getting people into space and all that? Some of them. I'm not gonna say I'm like okay. super prolific, but I know some of them. So there there are actual recordings of this where they were they launched people into space or launched people and they would shoot out of orbit or they would they would there, something would go wrong and so these poor souls were lost yep. and so there would be communications where they'd be like you know hello home base russia can you hear me and as they would get farther and farther and farther out in space the communication would fade the signal would fade um russia wasn't 
like we were with our with our astronauts they were they were far more i guess the word would be brutal in their testing barbaric they were they very would, barbaric yeah, in their okay, testings yeah okay we'll, we'll 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 go with barbaric i think that's probably a safe bet um and so there are out there in space in in wherever they've drifted if they've continued there are there are capsules with russian astronauts who were left to die yep. because russia was so the space race it was intense and very. i think when we watch movies like uh, yeah like when we watch apollo 13 or we watch these space movies and the space race and they show john f kennedy and all this i don't think there's enough understanding of just how important this was to people to get into space and to be the first to do this and to be the first to get to the moon and all these things there was such an intensity that yeah russia put people up in an attempt to get them to the moon or farther and they they sacrificed lives i mean they sent dogs and animals and like it was the the lore on it is if you get into it it makes you want to just like sit down and like cry because these are human beings that russia just said ha ha go and experiment merry christmas and hope you come back they didn't exactly and so to you, when you yeah. talk about when you talk about yuri gargarin like yeah he he was the success but before and even after him oh yeah it was it was that- it was it was a that kind of delineates the difference between Russia and America. Um, as yeah. Russia was kind of barbaric, as I said, uh, America yeah. was more methodical. They wanted to make yeah. sure it would work. They weren't going to try yeah. something that wasn't going to work. That's why it took us a little longer to get there, but we got there mm-hmm. much safer, much more efficient because of that. So yeah. um, next, uh, if I'm continuing or you want to say something else, I'm not sure. Yep. If you wanna... Yep. Go ahead. Okay. No. Nope. We're good. Uh, Let's go. I may have interrupted you. Sorry. (laughs) Um, It's all good. Okay. So uh, next would have been uh, the first American to orbit Earth, which was John Glenn, uh, which is very prolific. Uh, The capsule that he was in was packed with so much stuff, there was only sitting room. That's it. He had no other room whatsoever. Um, So, oh, excuse me. So that would be there. Um, Mm -hmm. The next big thing would be 1969 when the first moon landing occurred. Apollo 11 was the first space flight to ever land people on the moon. Neil Armstrong uh, was the first person on the moon. Uh, So I didn't actually know this, but I'll add it. Ed Kernan is the last man to step on the moon in 1972. Let's think about about that for a second. Yeah, let's let's talk about that for a second because if we're going to calculate... Now, there is a plan, which... It's interesting. We'll, we may, again, we're going to take some rabbit trails for a second here. But if we take 2024 and we take 1972, it's been 52 years yep. since anyone has stepped foot on the moon. We've sent probes. We've sent all these kinds of cool rovers and, like, all these things. The Artemis Orion capsule. Yeah. So 52 years. Now, recently, was it the Artemis capsule that was slated to land on the moon but didn't? No, so that was the test. Uh, the Artemis. Oh, okay. That was the first test of the program. Artemis two okay. is the one that's supposed to actually officially make that occur. Um, okay. So, and I can get into that in a a little later when I talk about NASA because we're going to mention NASA yeah. later on in more de- detail. So, so you you were you were very particular about how they don't talk about Ed about Ed. What is it about? Is there something about? Ed's story, or is it just he was kind of the last dude, and we don't talk about the last dude on on the moon? I don't think it really mattered that much. Um, you know, NASA's biggest thing was getting the first person on the moon. So yeah, Ed yeah. was there. He probably got a little praise for it. You know, he was able to say, "Hey, I set foot on the moon." But his reasoning yeah. for being there wasn't anything like spectacular, if that makes sense. He wasn't exactly, yeah, yeah. he wasn't yeah. there to make that milestone occur. So right. Um, that's why you've never really heard of him because he's not like he's not like Neil Armstrong. You know, everyone knows who Neil Armstrong was. You know, that's one small step for yeah. man, one giant leap for, for man, mankind. one giant leap for mankind. Yeah. Um. So yeah, his post NASA activities in 1976, he retired from the Navy and went into private businesses. He did petroleum, starting his own company. Um. He actually. 
he died in 2017 uh, at the age of 82. Um, oh, did he? He was the yeah. So he's. I mean, you think about it. You you get to walk on the moon. You've had a full life. But he was oh, yeah. he was the Gemini. He was a part of Apollo. He he was he was a career astronaut. Um, oh, I, okay. So how about here's we go. So as Cern, as as Cernan prepared to climb the ladder for the final time, he spoke these words. Currently, the last words spoken by a human being standing on lunar surface. Um, quote, Bob, this is Gene, and I'm on the surface. And as I take man's last step from the surface back home for some time to come, but we believe not too long into the future, I just like to say that I believe history will record that America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. And as we leave, we leave the moon at Taurus Lithro. We leave as we came, and God willing, we shall return with peace and hope for all, man came, all mankind. Godspeed, the crew of Apollo 17. That's beautiful. Like that is that's poetic. I, I just I, clearly the man knew how to write or had someone write for him. But I think he probably knew what he. I mean, all the astronauts were well spoken. They have they had intellectual whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. Gene Cernan was the last man, and and he's gone now. Um, and a lot of our astronauts of old have passed, and um, there there is that urge, that push to get back to the moon because that's where it all began for us as a country and as a people and as explorers and, and astronauts. That's what put us ahead of the Russians in the space race. Yep. Um, all right, so go ahead and continue. Okay. So next would have been another very famous thing, which was the first space shuttle launch. Um, yep. That happened in 1981. So if you look, it went from 1969 to 1981 before we launched a rocket again. Um, yeah. the, uh, the Saturn V, you know, it had outlived its usefulness at that point. Uh, while yeah. it was a spectacular rocket for its time and it did some amazing things, we realized we can't really use it for what we want to do next. And the whole right. reason really for the space shuttle was to begin, uh, placing satellites into orbit, um, and starting the correct, the construction of the International Space Station. Um, because the yeah. space shuttle had that cargo bay with the robotic arm, they could you know take the the capsules out uh, and mm -hmm. and start building things. Um, so that was in 1981. The next big milestone was in December of 2010 when the first private launch uh, launch company uh, actually went into Earth's orbit. Which can you guess what it is without looking? No, I, I I'm already reading it through so. <laughs> Well, it was it was space SpaceX. SpaceX. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, which we'll talk about SpaceX more. Uh, they launched their yep. Falcon Nine rocket. Um, so you know, then if we keep going, uh, Juno launched to Jupiter uh, to, for its five year journey uh, to bring back data and mm -hmm. observations. Uh, we are currently ongoing in space exploration. Um, you know, we've sent the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes, uh, which have both reached interstellar space. Um, Voyager yep. 2 is the furthest. Um, I forget exactly the amount. I actually just talked about it in a college post like two days ago. But life's been crazy, as you know, so my brain just sort of... Yep. <laughs> um, so uh, private companies started to come up. You had SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Rocket Lab, yep. um, Orbital... United, well, United Launch Alliance has been around a little longer, but it's still a private company. Mm -hmm. um, so the world's first private orbital launch site in New Zealand was made by Rocket Lab. Um, they're still kind of small, but they're also at the same time making a big name for themselves. Uh, if I recall correctly, yeah. their current like big rocket is called the Electron Rocket. Um, mm -hmm. And they have facilities in the U.S. as well as in New Zealand. Um it's actually a place that NASA can launch um, payloads um, if need be. So they have okay. connections with NASA. Uh, the first commercial rocket launch from New Zealand was Rocket Lab as well. Um, so they've made huge strides when it comes to launching a rocket from New Zealand, uh, which the reason for that is to get into a certain orbit. Um, but that's a whole other entire story. So... Um, then in 2020, uh, the first launch of a privately crewed flight uh, actually went to the space station, which was the first time uh, since 
19, no, 2000 and something, I can't remember when, uh, that we mm. launched astronauts from American soil um, with the Falcon 9 rocket uh, using the Dragon capsule um, or the Dragon 2 capsule. Uh, this specific mission was called the Crew 2. It was probably one of the biggest hyped missions that I can recall. I watched it straight up. I was like, this is huge. Um, to get us back into space from America was a big thing. Um, and it's successful um, with a lot more things on the way. So that's a little brief, you know, a, a brief overview of rockets, uh, where we came from, where we're at now, um, and what can come here in the future. So, Yeah. Well, and what's interesting is there, and this is the conversation we had um, yesterday regarding successful models versus unsuccessful models, there isn't really an unsuccessful model because all of them either were tested to the point where they were like, okay, it doesn't work. We need to redesign it. We need to do this, that, whatever. Um, so there isn't really an unsuccessful model because by the point, by the time they get, well, most of the time, by the time they get to the launch pad and are ready to be assembled, like they're, they've been tested over and over, which is, a lot of what the independent companies have been doing, um, Elon Musk's company comes to mind, SpaceX, all those guys, they're, some of them have had rockets explode on the launch pad. Um, and that's part of the quote unquote, the testing is to make sure, okay, can it withstand the, t the, the actual launch? Can it withstand going into space? All those kinds of things that you have to, you, you can't do with somebody on the, in the space capsule or whatever. You, no. you have to just, okay, We've 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 built it. Now will it work? And yeah, is it scary to watch a rocket not like fall apart or explode on the launch pad? Absolutely. But the reality is that's the only way you know if it's actually gonna work. Or right. if it doesn't work, where where did you go wrong and how do we need to do better? That's um, it. And I think because we're in we're in that yeah, so we're in that digital age where you know, if this had happened in the 1960s and they were doing all these tests, nobody would really know about it because nope. they were conducted you know, at the space center and nobody was really going over to watch those tests. But now in the digital age, they run video feeds from the launch pad and it's broadcast around the world. So yeah, we're watching these failures happen in real time. And so people are like, Oh, well, I don't know if this is actually going to work. It's like, well, no, it, it will. We just have to test it and make sure. And sometimes they're going to blow, they're going to go boom. And well, we have to then re. That's go ahead. one of the biggest things. Um, Cause I've, um, I've watched SpaceX a lot in the Starship, which is supposed to, you know, take us to the moon and to Mars. Um, and that's one thing they've said at both test launches is that um, they don't consider it a failure if the rocket explodes because it's giving them more data and more understanding of what they need to refine to make sure the rocket is a success. And that's the biggest thing. I've seen comments of people being like, well, they failed. It's done. You know, they, they just utterly lost right. all that money and they failed. Well, you've got to think about this. They know that it might not work. In fact, usually they plan yeah. for it that early in a stage. They know they're going to lose yeah. the money, but they've already, you know, worked that into their budget. They, they're they like, okay, this could happen. We need to make sure we have enough for this, 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 and this. And, I mean, SpaceX is funded by Elon Musk. They have no shortage of money. Trust me. Right. Regardless of this. Yeah. Um, I watched both Starship launches, and they were vo both hugely exciting because you got to see how much that just that one rocket launch changed the yeah. the whole phase of the second launch compared to the first launch, um, which is just it was an incredible thing to see, um, and yeah, that's something that people need to understand uh, in the rocket industry in the aerospace industry you're going to fail it's part of it the yeah. only way you learn to do what needs to be successful is to fail and the falcon 9 rocket failed i think five or ten times before it was actually able to land so the only way you can learn that is to keep trying and trying until you figure out hey this is the exact angle we need to come down at this is the speed we need to hit right you know we need to make sure these legs are you know, made of a certain material so that this doesn't happen. And yeah, there can still be failures at times. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes those are unplanned because of things that happen and you can't really change that. 
Um, but when you think about it, and most people just, you know, I've had to actually talk to people because they're like, well, it's just a straight failure. And I'm like, no, it's really not. And that's that's something to understand as we talk about rockets moving on, um, is that there are failures. You know, nothing is going to be perfect. A rocket can explode. Um, even a rocket that's been tested and tried can explode, um, which I'll I'll get a little more into that when we get to a certain point. Um, but yeah, so. So this is interesting. This we're gonna do a I'm gonna do a little bit of a flashback. Um, so Apollo One is one of the biggest tragedies NASA has had ever had experienced ever until we obviously endured the the shuttle disasters. Um, the Apollo One tragedy, for those who aren't aware, um, is where they Apollo One was going to launch and they were doing like a test or whatever, and they had the astronauts in the capsule, and a fire broke out. And all three died because there was nothing to stop it. And the investigation was, I mean, it was the impact upon the entire NASA program at that time was just, was catastrophic. Um, You had the first, it was the first Apollo one. It was going to go to like, we're doing it. Um, And what was discovered was, is they hadn't, they hadn't, they hadn't checked and triple checked. They hadn't done all of the homework they needed to do. And I mentioned earlier that the space race, it was a race. There was this idea and this feeling of both in the cultural zeitgeist of the, of the country, of the people, but also in the NASA program is we have to get this going. We got to beat the Russians. We can't be last. We can't, we can't even be second. It, It was a matter of pride. And looking through the lens of 2024, we can definitely analyze that and say, well, was that the right thing to do? Do we, did we really care about being first? And while I, I, I accept the, the, the lens of 2024, I also reject in this, but this specific instance that that lens would have a very hard time understanding the, the, what life was like in the sixties with all of this, there was so much at stake. Um, this was the cold, this was cold war stuff. This was, this was a, this was their, our, our, our identity as Americans that we, we could do this. We were going to get to the moon. We were going to go where no man had gone before. We were going to do this. And so a lot of the issues with Apollo one is, is that it was, it was, it wasn't that it was rushed, but it wasn't it, the due diligence wasn't due diligence wasn't there. Um, and I've watched a couple of documentaries on it and it's heartbreaking because these, they, they, they had, I think they had the choice to put the guys in there or not to put them in there. Um, and they chose to strap them in, but there was no escape. Like they, the amount of critical failures safety wise that, that were not, that were not ready for prime time was to bar, to use the word again, catastrophic and, and heartbreaking because their deaths could have been prevented. But there was this idea of, we have to go fast. We got to get this done. Um, and so, yeah, they re like after Apollo, after that fire, it was a, it was a come to Jesus moment for that crew and for that, for the for NASA. And they worked so hard, diligently, so hard to make sure those mistakes were never repeated. Um, it became, it became almost a cause for each, each person that put hands on the, on the capsule and the rockets, like we're not going to let Apollo one happen again. Um, and it was, it was jarring. It was in, the NASA program at that time was very intimate. It was very everyone knew everybody. You knew the three astronauts. Everybody. It was it was it's it was a family, and all of a sudden, three of your family members are are dead because we got we lost focus. And so, to your point about why we do what we do now with running these rockets and running these tests, yeah, does it look unpleasant to watch a million dollar? trillion dollar, whatever you want to, however much, however much money that rocket costs to put together to have it blow up on the launch pad. Yeah. Sucks. People are like, why are we spending money on this? We could have spent this money on this and that maybe, but with with a lot of these private companies, they're putting up their own money. Um, and it's, it. so it's that, it's also that, that duality of, yes, we have issues here at home, but we also want to look to the stars. We are human beings. We can't not look to the future and look to up uh, what's above us and what's beyond the planets. And what do we, what, where can we go from here? So there's no easy answer to the question of watching a, 
million dollar two five million dollar rocket go up in flames but apollo one has dictated since that we will take every precaution necessary and they guarantee you more than likely the lessons of apollo one are probably taught (laughs) in the spacex in the united launch like those those you know there may not be a lot of people who are still alive who are in the apollo program but those lessons those harsh realities um they stick around so to your point yeah we do is it does it suck to watch it blow up absolutely but what you say is hey we now know we got to do this right we got to this is this is where it went wrong let's fix that so that when we eventually get to the point where we actually are going to launch starship into the heavens and towards the moon there's not going to be a question of is this safe or is this ready? It's no, we're going to the moon and it's going to happen. And there's no question that everything's been done to prevent any possibility of repeating Apollo one or challenger or discovery. Um, because there's nothing worse than, than a failure that takes the lives of the explorers that we've, we've put on pedestals and looked to lead us into the, into the stars. Um, so, that's where my passion is. My passion is, look, we, we should never stop exploring. We should never stop wanting to go into the next part of our, of our galaxy, of our universe, or the next, the next exploration step, the next piece that we can grab and hold on to and turn around in our hands and go, this is, this is it. Okay, let's go. Let's go farther. Let's go deeper. Let's go into the final frontier to borrow the Star Trek um, nomenclature. So I've hijacked a little bit here. Uh, but Stefan, uh, if you want to pick up wherever you were when we left off, rockets, exploding, testing. Things. So um, that's one of the biggest things now about NASA. Uh, when they actually implemented the Crew 2 rocket to launch human beings, that rocket went through like three or four different test flights before they actually would approve it to actually have humans on it again. Um, NASA has went through a lot of um, criticism uh, and they've had to go through a lot of issues uh, and change the way they do a lot of things, the way their safety teams look at things, the way that they check things out um, because ultimately uh, we're going to, we're going to talk about something that's not pleasant uh, but people know it existed. They know it happened, and that was the Challenger shuttle disaster. Yeah. So I've watched, I've actually watched NASA's investigational video in regards to this. Now, of course, NASA isn't going to tell you everything. You know, they're they're telling what they need to tell. But the back end of the story is so I don't remember the temperatures, but the temperatures got like super cold, super super cold. The night before yeah. that launch, and the um, the engineer that went and checked the the shuttle out uh, could obviously see that there was some stress on the vehicle, but they were like, yeah. uh, "It's fine. We're going to launch anyways." So, if that engineer would have done his job correctly, um, and I know one thing was NASA was trying to push the launch of that ro- of the space shuttle. They wanted to get it into space, but. In my opinion, as someone who has seen what has happened, don't rush. In any way, don't rush. You want to make sure everything is safe for anyone. And that was the thing that happened. One, being the engineer. uh, Two, being that super cold weather. uh, Because that, when cold weather hits metal, it kind of expands and compresses. Um, So that Mm -hmm. also did not help the O-ring that actually caused the issue. when that solid rocket booster ignited what it pretty much did was the uh the flames from it hit the fuel tank uh so they came out of the rocket booster and they hit the fuel tank until they punctured the fuel tank well when the fuel tank punctured all of the pressure you know of the rocket just boom it it was just a canister to explode um and in the diagnostics nasa could see the pressure dropping in that rocket booster but then it would come back up But then it went back Uh, down again. So, you know, there's a certain point in time where you really have to tell and make sure when you see something like that, you got to be like, okay, there's a problem here. But, of course, at that time, it wasn't quite, you know, that simple. Because 
it wasn't until right near the end when they started to see a huge fluctuation and they was like, okay, something's yeah. wrong. And by that time, there's nothing that could have been done. Um, yeah. The Challenger disaster was, it was horrific. It was catastrophic. It was a nightmare. Um, I've talked to people that were there, saw it live on TV, and you can just tell even now today when they talk about it, they just, they're appalled that it happened. And yeah. like I said, that's one of NASA's biggest things now is safety. Um, mm -hmm. The government actually pretty much pushed them um, in fact, the whole reason the space shuttle program ended was because it was deemed unsafe. After having mm. two rockets explode, um, yeah. regardless of NASA's checks and balances on it to see to make sure it was ready and okay, it was deemed that it was unsafe. They needed to figure out a different vehicle to send people to space. Um, and that's why, for the longest time, you did not see any launches from America. Uh, NASA yeah. at that time had not worked with the private space industry yet, um, but the space shuttle, even though it had two critical failures, it also propelled us into space to build the International Space yeah. Station and beyond. It was an amazing vehicle, and its merits are, are great, but it also tests NASA's knowledge, and it made them have to be more thorough in their checks before a launch. Um, I'm sure if the weather ever got that cold again, uh, regardless of the rocket, NASA's going to be like, no. We ain't doing yeah. that. Uh, we're going to wait. Right. We're going to make sure this rocket's ready. It's safe um, and that no one's going to be hurt. And so that's something that I can, you know, you, you say, and this might be bad on my part, but you say it's hard to watch a rocket explode when it's being tested. Yeah. It's not when you're in the mindset of what my mindset is, you know, knowing what right. I know. Uh, but Yeah, you know, you, you know what's the purpose of it. You know yes. that it, it is, There's but if, if it does go... Someone who doesn't know, I can only imagine right. they're like, oh my goodness, that just exploded. That's right. horrible. Yeah. Um, but it's funny because at times, like, one of the first Starship uh, tests of just the ship, not with the booster, mm -hmm. uh, it, it landed, but literally, like, 30 seconds later, boom, it exploded. Yeah. So there's, there's actually a compilation on YouTube, uh, if you would want to go and watch it, uh, viewers, as well as you, Aaron, of yep. um, SpaceX failures of the Falcon 9 until they started to land it, and it, it shows the failures. Uh, so it shows you that things don't always go as planned. Nothing's perfect. Mm -hmm. The space industry is one of the hardest things to do because you have to get everything right. And it's not just yep. a simple, hey, the first time we do this, it's going to work. That's not how this works. Um, yep. Now, you know, companies that have the knowledge, they've done it for years, they build a new rocket, there's a potential they could make it work in the first time, but they still yeah. test it. They test every aspect of it because safety. Mm -hmm. Safety is one of the most yeah. paramount reasons for what what we do now in the space industry, especially with rockets. So um, yeah. as you said, uh, I, I told you yesterday, unsuccessful models wasn't really an un unsuccessful model. There was some disasters right. that occurred, but I can't yeah. say that there was any model that was unsuccessful in um, meeting the mission criteria that it was set to do. Um, yeah. So, you know, the ones that got us to space, uh, just to mention them, would be the Saturn V rocket, uh, the Space Shuttle, um, the Falcon 9 rocket, um, currently, and the Soyuz rocket, because we use the Russian capsule in between the Space Shuttle and what we now use by SpaceX's private, uh, private owned rocket. Um, the ones mm -hmm. that got us to the moon, Saturn V has been the only rocket to actually get humans to the moon uh, because we have not went to the moon since the Saturn V. So yeah. there's not really another rocket that the U.S. has that's went to the moon. They've had probes, you know, orbit it, different things like that. Yeah. But um, the Gemini capsule and the Saturn V uh, were two of the biggest things to make landing on the moon possible. Um, then, you know, it just sort of went from there. The Gemini capsule being the first, uh, the first space capsule. So it was before yeah. the Apollo 11. So I want to make mm -hmm. sure and, and just, you know, clarify that. So it was one yeah. of the first things to get us to space. Um, so there wasn't, you, you put the question in here and I, I got to answer it. There was no ship that took the space shuttle to space. The space shuttle was made to right. go to space. Um, the, yeah. the thing that made that occur uh, was SRBs, solid rocket boosters, and the fuel tank, which yep. Um, yep. 
for the people that can watch this live, uh, I'm going to show you exactly what that is. So you're not like, what, what is he talking about? What is this thing that he's mentioning? Um, yeah. So let me just pull up a picture here. And we'll... Okay, so right here is actually the space shuttle Atlantis launching, like, as it's literally coming off the pad. Um, as you can see, my mouse here. Um, so these white cylinder type things are the SRBs or the solid rocket boosters. So they're filled with mm -hmm. fuel, and their entire job is to boost the, the shuttle to a point where it can then get into orbit. Uh, the big thing in the middle is the fuel tank. It is what supplied the SRBs. Um, with power and by saying that I need to make a correction with the Columbia the leak actually happened um, yeah no it happened in the SRB so it happened in this uh, along one of these o-rings here and then it punctured the tank and that's what caused the issue so that's the fuel tank that's the SRB or solid rocket booster sorry I use the acronyms now because <laughs> that's what I know uh, but that's right. the space shuttle yeah in a nutshell that's how it launched uh, now, the space shuttle itself had engines. Those engines also were part of making sure the rocket got into space, but they were not the main driving force to get it up and out of the Earth's atmosphere. That was the whole reason for the SRBs and the fuel tank. Okay. So we talked about the Challenger disaster. Um, the other one, so the Challenger exploded on takeoff, um, and then the other one exploded on landing. Yep. Talk us through, because again, there was they were they were two incidents mm. um, for very different re for different whatever. So, talk us through the second and final um, kind of disaster that that put the shuttle service um, on uh, it put them it put them out of business. So the Columbia disaster, as you said, was different. Uh, it did not happen at launch. It actually happened when the shuttle was re-entering the Earth's atmosphere from space. Um, when the rocket actually left the atmosphere at launch, um, a few of the panels on the underneath of the shuttle, which I can't, can't really find a good picture of, uh, but they are, um, they're kind of like heat resistant panels because when you yeah. enter back into the earth's atmosphere, there's a lot of heat because you're going back down through that atmosphere. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of heat being projected on the bottom of that vehicle. So when the shuttle came down, it was pretty much coming down in an arch down mm -hmm. in because the, the, the bottom part of it was protected by that heat. Well, a, a large chunk of those plates came off. And NASA, if I recall, they knew it, uh, but they didn't think it was going to cause an issue. Um, however, when, if, I, if I recall correctly, they didn't, they didn't think the damage was as bad as it was, is what the thing was. Mm -hmm. They thought it was minor. Yeah. And to an extent, if it would have been minor enough they probably could have got back into the atmosphere and been fine. However, because of that immense heat building up um, without that protection, it pretty much got inside the shuttle and it just broke it apart uh, into a bunch of little pieces. Um, and the worst thing being is the fact that they say that the um, in both the Challenger and Columbia, um, the crew was probably alive when this happened. They didn't die immediately. And... Yeah, that's probably one of the hardest things to fathom, uh, especially yeah. for the Columbia, considering there was a school teacher on board. Um, and that's just that's even for me, that is one of the most tragic things that I, I've had to learn. Um, you know, like I said, the space shuttle has huge merits. Seeing one launch even today is just an yeah. amazing thing to see. But because of those issues, um, the space shuttle was deemed unsafe. And I can't say that I blame them because the loss of, you know, uh, the space shuttles usually had a crew of see, about seven or eight people on them, give or take the mission. Um, that's, you know, about 16 lives that were lost uh, because of, you know, you know, the, the first one would have been negligence. Um, and the mm -hmm. second one, uh, I, I can't say if Columbia was negligence um, or if that was just something that happened, um, because the shuttles were reused. Um, so there could have yep. been an issue that they just didn't know, or they couldn't see, um, you know, 
we don't really know that fact. Now there's probably people that do know that fact, but it's not something that's common knowledge. Um, so yeah. that's that's the difference between the Columbia uh, and the Challenger disasters. Um, I, I, I don't think I was born. I'm trying to remember um, the Challenger disaster. So give me a couple of moments to challenge. Challenger explosion um, was... 1986, I would have been four years old, so I don't remember that. Um, I definitely don't remember uh, and because actually, I wasn't even born. Uh, you weren't even born. What I, I do remember the stories, so um, Sally Ride was the teacher. She, was, she wasn't on the Columbia. She was on the Challenger. Challenger, um, yeah. So So she students across the country were watching and, like, the launch, and um, there was just this – like collective heartbreak at that moment um, because they had all gotten to know, like when, when the, when the, when the, when the, when the space shuttles would go to the, to the moon or sorry, <laughs> to the moon, when the space shuttles would go to space, let's make, let's make that clear. Uh, that'd be cool if a space shuttle went to the moon. I, I don't know. That'd be fun. Uh, but when they went to space, like you got to know the, the astronauts, like it was a big deal. Like they were interviewed, they were profiled, like you got to know their stories, you know, there was big, it was a big deal. Um, and when that, when the challenge, when that happened in 86, um, it was a collective nationwide, um, kind of experience because everyone was watching it on the television or everyone was watching it. People were watching it live at the, at the site. Um, and there was just this, confusion because it hadn't ever happened before a space shuttle had never blown up um they, they were assured to be safe um and so when that happened it was the nation kind of got put into shock um and ronald reagan the president at that time had a a, a night an evening address to the country um in which he put to words um about the loss and what it meant for the for the country now discovery i was alive when that happened you mean Columbia? Um, discover, sorry, Columbia. Good lord! It was two thousand. Why am I trying to s- February first, yeah, two thousand three? Columbia- yeah. So I was, I was, al- I was alive enough in that moment, um, and that was, um, I don't know. It just, it was. I do remember that, and I do just remember being just in disbelief that that's that that's how. Um, that that's how it ended um, and that they were coming home. I think that's what made Columbia even harder is, is that they were coming home and that that was, that that was, that they were just, they were almost, they were so close, um, but they couldn't, we couldn't get them home. Um, so the loss of that program put us the end, the end of like the, so the private companies, they were already in probably in progress, but they really started stepping up their game um, because now NASA had to re, re, de, re, de, redesign a shuttle or redesign something that could then do it. Um, so a lot of companies stepped in. So let us shift into the various private companies and operations in existence. Um, the big one that we all know is SpaceX. Um, and that's Elon Musk's company um, that is funded and, and he is... He's like, he's visibly always involved. He's always at the launches. He's always retweeting it, sharing it, um, whatever. Actually, sorry, not retweeting. He's reposting it now that it's X. Thank you, Elon Musk, for relabeling Twitter for reasons, Um, which we're live on X, by the way. We're not live on Twitter anymore. We're live on X. Um, So, yeah, there's SpaceX. And so I'm, I'm curious for you, Stefan, between SpaceX and United Launch Alliance, what are the differences that you see between these two programs? Okay. Uh, so United Launch Alliance has been around a lot longer. Um, it's actually been around. Let me find the time so that I'm not telling you something that's not true. Um, uh, come on now. Where am I? Where am I looking here? So, um, it doesn't exactly say when they started, at least not when I'm looking at their actual site. Uh, if I went to Wikipedia, I probably could, but after going to college, they tell you not to look at Wikipedia because it's not an actual, (laughs) like, uh, authentic site. So 
The biggest thing with ULA, uh, and this is what makes them a step above SpaceX when it comes to like uh, quality, um, would be that yeah. um, they have. Um, so on their website, they say they have they're combining more than a hundred years of launch history. So they've been around a long time, uh, but they're all the only company that's ever achieved more than 150 consecutive launches since 2006. Um, and every single wow. one of those launches has been a success. They have never had a failed launch. So in regards to quality, uh, ULA is, is where it's at. Um, they're a company that's been around a long time. They're very respected, especially in the aerospace community. They have contracts with the Air Force, you know, NASA, uh, and whoever else. You know, different companies have them launch different things. Um, they just launched something recently in their newest rocket, um, which was supposed to go to the moon, uh, but there was a bit of an issue with that whole thing. Um, SpaceX, on the other hand, um, they're the innovators. Uh, that would be my best way to really describe SpaceX because what they've done is unheard of. Um, we never thought back in the day that we would be able to reuse a booster, to be able to land mm -hmm. a booster back down to Earth and within <clears throat> six weeks have it ready to be reused. That is insane. Like That's just yeah. crazy. Um, now, that didn't happen overnight. That took years of testing, years of refinement. Um, in fact, it was actually to the point... That if Falcon 9 did not succeed, SpaceX was bankrupt. They were going to lose everything. Wow. Um, and so it was a big push for them. Um, and, and as we know now, um, the Falcon 9 rocket exists. Um, I'm going to actually share my screen again to give people just a little view of some things regarding it. Um, sure. It's just, oh, not that one. So this is the actual SpaceX website. Uh, as you can see, the Falcon 9, it says the first orbital class rocket capable of reflight, uh, which is huge. Mm -hmm. um, so to date, it's had 291 launches with 249 landings and a total reflight of 223. So right, let's keep that up there for a second because I'm going yep. to, for, for the, for the layman out there, which includes me, we're going to do 290, we're going to do 249 divided by, oops, divided by. Divided by computer. Let's go 291. 291. So that's an 85.5% success ratio. Um, that's insane. Yeah. But that's, as that's, you, I mean, you you can tell because those launches that is that is calculated are the ones that also failed. That's mm -hmm. the ones that failed uh, because the ones that landed were the successful ones. But an 85% success rate with a rocket that had never been flown before, um, that was completely new, had never been heard of, to do what has, it has done now, it is a rocket that everyone's seen, everyone knows it. You hear the Falcon mm -hmm. 9 in the rocket industry, you know what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's used, so this, this is the Falcon 9, this is the rocket right here. Um, it is 229.6 feet tall. It has a diameter of 12 feet. Its mass is 1,207,920 pounds. Um, it's, uh, its payload to uh, low Earth orbit is 50,265 pounds. Uh, its payload to uh, geo, uh, geostationary transfer orbit is 18,300 pounds. And its payload to Mars is 8,860 pounds. Um, now I can't say that the Falcon 9 will ever be able to get to Mars. I don't think it's possible because it just doesn't have the, mm -hmm. the fuel needed, um, to be able to do that. Um, but it is really cool because the site allows you to see the stages, the engines, yeah. uh, the landing legs. Uh, so it's, it, if you really want to check this out, like, you know, at a, at a more, deep level than what I'm doing right now, this is a way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the coolest things about this rocket is it has grid fins on it. <laughs> those grid fins are actually, when the booster's landing, those grid fins help to maneuver the rocket as it's coming back down to Earth. 
uh, to where it needs to go. Interesting. And that's one of those things that they have to program. Um, so that's that's Falcon Nine. That's SpaceX is probably most prominent rocket. Next would be the Falcon Heavy. The Falcon Heavy mm-hmm. has over five million pounds of thrust. Uh, it's essentially oh, three Falcon Nine boosters strapped together, essentially. Okay. Um, it has not had as many launches because uh, it's not really needed unless you really need to take something heavy into space. Um, mm-hmm. That's what it's for. That's that's its whole purpose and reasoning. Um, so they actually land these cores back down to Earth. So it separates and it lands back down to Earth. Uh, and I saw huh. one of them. It's really cool to see. Um, that's incredible. So that's that's the Falcon Heavy. So it's pretty much just the Falcon 9 on steroids. <laughs> that's really yeah. a way to think about it. Uh, and then, of course, the Starship. The Starship is to service Earth's orbit, Moon, Mars, and beyond. Uh, the Starship, in my opinion, is a beautiful rocket. Uh, I love seeing the silhouette of it before it launches. Um, but it is gigantic. It is yeah. 397 feet tall. It is the tallest rocket Oof. to ever exist when fully stacked, uh, which means the um, the first stage and the second stage are connected together. Um, okay. The rocket is also, it has another high achievement. It is the most powerful rocket to ever launch. Um, it is... It is absolutely insane when you see this thing launch. You can tell the power that comes out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you actually mm-hmm. look at articles of the first test, you'll see what I'm talking about, and that's all I'm going to say. Let's just say there were some issues that grounded them for months until they got it mm-hmm. fixed uh, because it was yeah. deemed unsafe. Um, but the Starship, is, it's, it's, a big, it's a big rocket. <laughs> it's definitely something to see. Um, it's powered by liquid oxygen and also uh, subcooled liquid methane. So they use liquid methane and liquid oxygen as the, the propellant and the coolant. Uh, liquid oxygen is usually most, mostly used, uh, LOX is used as the coolant uh, because it cools mm-hmm. everything. That's what liquid oxygen is. You wouldn't want to stick your hands in liquid oxygen. Bad idea. Um, so right. as a, to sh- kind of show people how cold liquid oxygen is... Um, so this is this is a Falcon 9 and you see this steam essentially this mist mm-hmm. when the rocket is loading propellant it has to um depressurize the extra so it's it's bleeding it off pretty much so of course okay. Florida it's cold or it's warm so that reaction shows you this is this is liquid oxygen this is like it this is it coming back out so when you see mm-hmm a rocket launching and you see the white clouds. What that is, is that's the coolant that is being bleeded out. The extra that's being bleeded out is the pressures rising. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why you see that so prominently when a rocket launches, uh, because of mm-hmm. that. Now, if you're in a place where it's warm, it's not quite or uh, cold. It's not quite so prominent to see so much of the liquid oxygen, right. but most of the places we launch are pretty warm, California, Florida, Texas. Mm-hmm. So, you usually see it. Um, so that's SpaceX. Um, United Launch Alliance has what they call the Vulcan rocket, which is actually their newest rocket. It just launched a few weeks back for the first time. Hmm. Um, so it is, as you can see, they have all kinds of numbers. Um, United Launch Alliance mm-hmm. is huge in giving you information about their rockets. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm not going to read all this, but if people want to look it up, they can go to their website uh, United Launch Alliance, and then just go to the Vulcan rocket. Um, but they they tell you literally everything. If you really want to learn, they they go deep, um, giving the in- infrastructure updates of how it's built, where it's put together, how it's put together, um, all those things. So they've had the Atlas V, the Delta IV, and the Delta II. These rockets okay. are they're. They've stood the test of time, let's say that. Mm -hmm. So United Launch Alliance, like I said, they're a company that um, they're reliable. You know that when Mm -hmm. they launch a rocket, it's going to work because that's their goal. Yeah, Uh, That's what's made them who they are. It's a lot like the comparison like you would make, and this is just kind of what I was thinking in my head, like SpaceX is the Corvette. It's the shiny red Corvette that everyone goes, ooh. 
ooh, that's that's a that's a nice looking machine. I like oh yeah, rah, 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 rah. and then ULA is kind of like that old reliable station wagon that has a good engine, has got good performance. It's it's gonna get you there. You know, it might not look that it might not look shiny, but you know, it's dependable. It's always been there. You've never had to like go back and rework it. It's it's consistent. It's mm-hmm. the workhorse. Um, I think it's very interesting because like ULA, I've seen some friends talking about it on Facebook here and there. I've been like, oh, ULA. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I was just learning about with, with that with Stefan. And then to like when you go to SpaceX, like it's all about we launched a car into space with <laughs> spaceman music and they, you know, all this stuff that is cool. And I don't deny that they're it's legit, but it kind of feels like sometimes ULA is they're just trying. They're just under the radar. They're doing the job they need to do. And then, you know, SpaceX, it's like, look at how pretty our ships are. And so that's, that's, a, that's a very oh, an, an, an oversimplification of the situation. Yes. But it feels like, you know, you, you <laughs> like it. Yes. ULA yes. is very much very open and like wanting you, get, wants to give you information. And it's kind of the neighborhood guy. You say, oh, yeah, he's doing some cool stuff. You know, whereas SpaceX is. You know, they've got a mansion with massive projects they're always working on. But I think both companies have, have are valid. Like both oh, yeah. companies have they have they have money behind them and they're working on it. Um as as the an fact aside, that we uh to something yeah. you said earlier that I just want to make sure people are aware of, because uh, you said the rocket is assembled on the launch pad. That is not correct. Um oh, okay. they are they are constructed in these buildings. Oh, okay. Uh, so ULA has their own building, um, and they're kind of, I guess you'd call them, well, what NASA calls theirs is the VIB or vertical or vertical assembly building. Uh, they bring the rocket, yeah. and they put it straight up, and then they build it, put it together, and then they roll it to the pad. Um, so just a, just a little aside for you to know as well. Uh, but this is another thing about ULA, if you're looking, um, Aaron. They photograph yep. everything. Literally everything yeah. they'll show you, what they're doing. SpaceX is not that way. They're like you said, yeah. they're very private about things. They don't really share a whole lot. But ULA is like, yep, we're here. We're doing this. We want you to see it. It looks really cool. Yeah. We're proud of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that. Um, next would be NASA, which we got to talk about NASA, of course, um, because yep, we've bad mouthed NASA's shuttles, so we need to like redeem them here. Right. Uh, so. Yeah. NASA has built a rocket called the Space Launch System, or SLS for short. Um, it is a rocket. I mean, that's that's what it is. But it is a rocket that is reusing parts of what was used for the space shuttle. And that's okay. that's one of those things where you can really get into a conversation with people. Uh, I did a school paper about it, and I'm like, why is NASA going backwards in technology? Well, NASA's administrator, yeah. um, he believes that going with the tried and true method is going to save. Uh, while a lot of people believe using the private space companies to do these things is better because they're innovative, yeah. they're changing it. But it yeah. took it took way longer than it should have to create this rocket because of the fact yeah. that they wanted to reuse old parts. The RS twenty five engines were used on the space shuttle. The solid rocket boosters yeah. were used on the space shuttle. So yeah. I have mixed opinions when it comes to the SLS because of yeah. that. But the SLS, I mean, it is an impressive rocket to see it. Um, yeah. NASA has worked to make it an impressive rocket. They actually launched it successfully. Um, but it's not able to be landed back down with boosters, you know, that's another thing uh, okay. with Starship. Starship is looking to um, be able to reland the stage one in the gantry, uh, this gantry here that you see. They call these chopsticks. Yeah. They're wanting to be able to slide that rocket straight back down into those chopsticks to be able to Oof. reuse it. That's going to take time. Yeah. That's going to take time. But that's exactly what this is used for. Uh, if you was wondering what those arms are for, they're trying yeah. to essentially catch a rocket out of space. Never been done before. But again, (coughs) excuse me, SpaceX, they do crazy things. 
I think that should be their mod their their mantra. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> SpaceX, we're crazy. Right. Exactly. So, but this is this is the SLS and the vertical assembly building being built. Um, yeah. So it looks a lot like the space shuttle in some respects, the core stage, yeah. and the, the two rocket boosters. But the biggest thing is the Orion capsule up here. That's what's going to mm-hmm. carry astronauts to space uh, through the okay. Artemis program, which we mentioned. Um, Artemis's plan is to get us back to to space, uh, to the moon, where NASA wants to eventually colonize the moon. And once the colonization yep. of the moon has occurred, they want to move on to Mars, which is where SpaceX is looking to go as well. But SpaceX is also going to help get um, get us back to uh, the moon as well. That's one of the reasons there's been a lot of testing of the Starship, because they're trying to prepare and get it ready for launch. Yeah. Um, so those are... Those are just some really, like you said, entry level. Uh, well, and I, th- I think it's interesting that like they want to get back to the moon. They want to build a colony on the moon. Um, I think the harder, the harder, the harder d- job is going to be getting to Mars um, and, and not, but not just getting to Mars, but getting onto Mars and surviving Mars uh, because that's, that's the wild card. We know enough about Mars environment through the rovers and all that. Um, but we also, we don't, we don't know what the human, what's going to happen when we try and, you know, put human beings on the planet or on Mars. Like we know, but we don't know. Like that's part of what, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't know, I don't know if you even know this, but, um, Mm. it has been determined that, don't don't even ask me how long ago this was, but it has been determined okay. that Mars had a completely different um, environment on it. Uh, it was a thriving environment, um, right. lush with water. So a lot of why NASA has sent the Perseverance rover and the other rovers there is to determine mm-hmm. what changed, what happened. Yeah, you know, is there signs that someone or something lived here? Uh, that is one mm-hmm. of the, the jobs of uh, the Perseverance or what they call the Percy rover. Um, one mm-hmm. of its jobs is to gather samples to potentially bring them back to Earth, but to search for any signs of alien life. Um, and that's that's been its whole mission. Uh, in fact, an article today, uh, the Ingenuity helicopter that went with it, uh, mm-hmm. it was pretty much finished it did its final mission so it is now done uh but percy is still active doing what it's supposed to do so yeah mars is a very harsh environment like you said um when it comes to uh uh, colonizing mars a person that has the game plan is elon musk he already knows what he wants to do he already has game plans set of how he would do it and that's his goal his goal is to occupy yeah. Mars. That's the whole reason why SpaceX was really invented. That's been his goal from the beginning, and he's pushing towards it. And the people that work for him, that's their goal as well because yeah. that's what they want to do. And there's some brilliant people at SpaceX. Brilliant, absolutely. Um, to be able to do the things that they do, to be as innovative as they are. But that's in any any aerospace company. NASA has those people. United Launch yeah. Alliance has those people. Uh, maybe here soon I might be one of those United Launch Alliance people. But <laughs> Finger, Fingers crossed. Fingers, fingers crossed. crossed. Yes. Um, but the thing, the, the fact of the matter, like I said, aerospace is ever-changing. Uh, in most cases, mm-hmm. it's new technology. Like I said, with NASA, it's kind of went backwards. And when I read the article yeah. and learned about that, I I questioned it a little bit. But... I'm not the administrator, you know, I can't make those decisions. He he makes those yeah. decisions and like I said, the the SLS has its merits. It's it's a rocket, it works. But it seems like going back in technology isn't always the mm-hmm. greatest thing to do. So yeah. Well, I think if you were again as an outsider, I'm not a not nowhere near any of these programs knowledgeable or understanding, but when we when we look looking from the outside in, um it it does have when you compare the different models of rockets from ULA to SpaceX to NASA, um, you you have a hard time not wanting SpaceX or ULA to succeed 
because they're new, they're different, they're they're advancing, they're changing the game, they're seeking out the next big thing, they're trying to innovate and rework and reimagine and remodel and and take the next step into the future of space and exploration and the journey. Whereas looking at that setup from NASA, um, and I understand why they say we you know we're reusing stuff we already have, um, but it. It also brings into question, and and there's I mean obviously there's complex layers to this right. So NASA funding is an issue. NASA uh, you know uh, programs that they're allowed to use based upon who's in power in the presidency and who's in the in the House and the Senate and all of that all the budgetary items that depending on who's holding the purse strings and who's playing games and who's trying to win po- points whatever that directly impacts and affects. NASA, among many other federal programs. And so with NASA, my guess, and it's just a guess, again, there's no knowledge, it's just a feeling, is is that they're like, we need to save money. We need to be able to like validate our existence. And to validate our existence, we're going to use what we already have and innovate as much as we can using everything that we have in the warehouse or everything we've got in the system to then put forth a a, 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 a launch system that, that's functional and will do what we need to do is just not going to be as shiny or functional in the ways that these other private companies have managed to put together. And so I don't, there's no shame in NASA's game. Like, again, I'm not an authority on anything. I think I understand why that, why it was what it was. Um, but I think what you're kind of alluding to and what a lot of people, I think commentary about NASA recently has been is, are we, are we innovating are we following in the spirit of John F. Kennedy and and the and and the the race and and the hunger for the innovation and the future and the new and the next step and the next level and 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 the challenge of making something bigger and better that will get us to the moon and beyond and that's a, a lot of people have questioned i mean i've read some read some things and stuff that people have questioned does NASA really have what it takes? And the answer is, of course they do. But is it because they're being hamstrung by budget or being hamstrung by people's requirements for how the program is going to look? And, you know, you, so here's the thing you look at, at a federal, pro, at a federal program or a federal, whatever, there's a lot of layers and it's complex, right? There's rules, there's regs, there's, there's pieces, there's parcels and all this. So they have to go through all this, I would call it red tape, but they have to go through all these levels of bureaucracy and and whatever. When you look at ULA and SpaceX, they don't have much of that. They just go, we're going to make this. Here we go. Let's dance. And there's just that unwavering, like, I don't even want to call it, the unwavering march forward into the new future of space travel. Um, and even like Virgin Galactic, Virgin Galactic is kind of, they're in the background. They're still, they're still working it out. They're still climbing the ladder. They're still trying to, to get to commercial space travel. Like there's Rocket not Lab. a lot. Yeah. Rocket Lab, stuff like that. And so it's, it's this weird moment where NASA, the legacy of NASA, again, outsider looking in has always been about the next big thing. And in, I think since, challenger and since columbia there's been this kind of like slowdown um that we we just we're not sure we want to get back up there that fast because of the tragedies we've we've endured um but it's also and again this is an i feel statement this is again just a a natural a reaction for me is we honor the ones we lost but we don't let that stop us Mm -hmm. we don't we don't get stuck in this place of, well, we just, we just aren't going to use the new stuff. We're going to just, we're going to use what we always had and that's going to work. And maybe, but are we, are we reaching for the stars or are we just looking to them and hoping that this gets us where we need to get? Um, that's a metaphor I'm saying, obviously I'm not saying like, we're not reaching. We are, they're putting together a program. NASA is doing stuff, but it's like, are we just kind of looking to the stars and making it are we reaching for the stars and going, I want to get there. Let's make it happen. And let's get, let's, let's get some, let's take some risks with some equipment. Let's, let's test it thoroughly. Let's, let's, let's innovate. Let's, let's challenge SpaceX. Let's challenge ULA. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's just, again, it's, 
I always when I the, the shuttles I would watch them as I was a kid. I would watch the space program. I would I would just because I was a Star Trek fan, right? I'm a Star Trek kid, and looking at those space shuttles and looking at those launches and just going, "Whoa, we're getting there, we're going there," and then it stopped. And we're still going. I mean, we use we use Russian launches, so use capsules, and we we're still going to space, but we're we're just kind of maintaining. And I think ULA and and SpaceX they offer that opportunity to take the the metaphor of the kitchen sink and the kitchen the kitchen and to just smash it apart and remodel it and make it something entirely different, entirely new, and entirely ch- extraordinary um, in the future that it holds. So. Yeah, there's a lot of feelings. And again, I'm your every I'm I'm kind of like your everyday guy. Like I want to see us back on the moon. I want to I want to see humanity reach to the stars. I want us to reach to Mars. I want us to reach beyond. I want us to get out into the deep dark recesses of the universe and see space. what there is to be seen. Yeah, interstellar, which again, that's there's that there's the reality of if any if we if we send anybody out there they're probably not coming back. Um, and that's that's the reality of it right now is is that we don't have the ability to bring them back. We have the ability to send them, but that's bring why them back we've home sent probes, is, because we know they're not yep, coming back. A lot of, lot of, a lot of that. Um, um, I will so just here's say what I'm going to say. As a go ahead. Side, um, you was talking about the administrator with, uh, or with NASA and the, the budget. Yep. So the budget committee is a huge thing. Uh, but I also read articles where there's specific people within NASA administration that does not agree with the administrator's thoughts on using old technology uh, to do something okay. that new technology could do. Uh, and in okay. fact, they were very upset that it took so many years for the SLS to be a thing because of going backwards in the direction. So uh, okay, there's it's a very touchy subject. Um, but I yeah. do understand what you're saying with budgeting. I've learned NASA budgeting. I had to do it. It's a pain. Yeah. It is a pain. Yeah. Uh, and it is something that is important and it has to be done. And there's, there's checks and balances and there's red, that red tape, as you said. Um, so I can, I can kind of understand it, like I said, but then my brain being who I am, seeing what I've seen and what I want to do, I can't a hundred percent agree with the fact of going and using outdated technology when you could still yeah. make a new rocket. It may take a little longer, but you could still make those innovations for a better rocket. Um, I will say yeah. that the Artemis II rocket will have a different engine on it. Uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne is making a new engine for the Artemis II rocket or the SLS-2 rocket. Um, but yeah. that's really the biggest innovation in regards to it so far that I've seen anything. So, yeah. Nice. Well, I think I'm I'm going to call us as or we'll 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 take on the basic concept of rockets next week. Um, I think we've we've hit that hour and twenty three s- sweet spot. I I don't want us to go any longer. I want our audience to to like be able to take in everything we've kind of thrown at them and a rain lot. down on them. Like yeah, it's it's oh, been I also a lot. Need and to there, apologize. And, I got to make sure and make my apology for last oh, yeah, yeah, last yeah. week's episode. I am human. I made a mistake. Uh, and to the people that truly know this, I am sorry. Um, I said that the Enterprise from Star Trek uh, is, <laughs> is is what brought the aircraft okay, carrier hold on. and the space so shuttle. Here's, I want to make a note here. <laughs> when he said it, my brain short-circuited, and I wanted to say something, but you were so far down the story that I was like, eh, whatever. But... In my head, I was like, no, oh, no, oh, crumb. I should have said, oh, I, well. So that's what I did continue. afterwards, too. <laughs> but it, we was already way too far <laughs> into things. So my apologies. Yeah. Uh, the Enterprise for Star Trek actually came from the Enterprise that has been around since the 1700s, the Navy, yep. uh, all those things. So my apologies for that mistake. I knew I did it. Um, and, you know, like I said, we're all human. We make mistakes uh, there's a lot of information that we try to retain in these podcasts, and sometimes that may get a little jumbled or mixed up. Uh, but I just wanted to make a thorough apology for that to make sure you knew I knew what I was talking about, that the correction was made. Um, so, yeah. yeah, just to add that. It's And well, it's funny is, is that the Enter, like I loved. So the Enterprise, when Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek, the fact that he. Well, originally it was the Yorktown, but then they changed it to Enterprise. 
I love just how culturally that name now holds a place and it held it. What's it? So your point was, was half right because they did build the shuttle enterprise. It never went into space, but it was, it flew on the back of an airplane. Like it, it did things. And it's, I, I believe it still sits at the NASA facility as like a display model. The enterprise is there. Um, but that the enterprise shuttle was absolutely a Star Trek connection. Yes. Um, there's pictures of the, of the there's there. pictures of the, yeah, T the TOS crew. There's pictures of them standing next to the Enterprise as they roll it out. Um, and I think that is a lovely kind of when science and science fiction collides and creates just this sublime moment of, all right, we've 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 put the two together and. The name and, and as Captain Kirk says, or Picard says, let, you know, let them never forget the name Enterprise. Um, the Enterprise now means so much more to so many people because of the connections that it shares with our Navy history, our space flying history, and now our film and our nerd history. And eventually, the name Enterprise will follow whatever the next iteration of ships you know, as they fly into space and seek out, you know, the final frontier in the undiscovered country. Um, I just, I don't know. It's, it's exciting, but it's also cool because it's like my own, my own nerddom has its place in history. The enterprise, no one right. will forget the name enterprise. Um, and they'll, they'll go to Wikipedia and they'll go enterprise and they'll look at that history and go, Oh my gosh, that name has had it. That name has power and it has meaning and it has importance and we 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 are very human beings are all about importance and and names that carry weight and, and and meaning and they they're strong names the enterprise is a strong name so next week we'll talk about rockets and how rockets go and all the things we'll also have more topics to talk about who knows if we'll actually talk about aliens i don't know we'll we'll see we'll see if that conversation has legs or webbed feet as the aliens would have um, area 51 <clears throat> anything else you want yeah. <laughs> Anything else you want to throw in at the end there? No, I think that's about all. Um, hopefully the information that I provided you, you know, taught you something you didn't know. Um, you know, I love talking yeah. about this stuff, as you can see. You know, it was it was fun for me. And for the people that see the video, you will see my screen. Uh, you'll actually be able to see hands on those rockets to see it a little better um, and, and some things like that. Um, so we hope you enjoyed the episode. Um, and I Absolutely. hope that uh, you have a great week coming up as we prepare for next week. Um, and we'll see you next week. Definitely. We'll be back again next week. We want to give a shout out to the actual software that we're producing this on. Um, it is powered by... So it's Riverside.fm. Um, we're using it to record, but also to live stream out to Twitter right now. We have the option to live stream to YouTube and LinkedIn, oddly enough, um, and Facebook, I think. So there's a good chance we'll do that again. We'll try that next week. We'll try multiple live streams to see if it catches. Um, Twitter slash x.com is always tricky because sometimes you get engagement and sometimes you don't. Uh, so that's the episode. My name is Aaron. That's Stefan. We will see you next week. Feel free to check us out. Um, adelayedteacher.com is where you can find um, our little website with the player for the web episode. And uh, we will, yeah, we'll see you next time. Keep, what is it? Keep the skies clear. How do we, how, clear how, are we, how do we want to close this out? Clear skies. Clear, yeah, make, get, get those clear skies um, and join us in the journey into the final frontier. Until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you on the flip side.